Yeah, Dead Ringers from 1988, directed by David Cronenberg. And I do love David Cronenberg. He is a body horror master, Canadian legend. But uh, I haven't seen as many as I'd like to have seen. Uh, I know The Fly is probably the most famous, most mainstream. I have not seen The Fly, which uh, is another knock to my film kid credibility. But um, I'm a big fan of Videodrome and Scanners. I love Scanners. I watched that, uh, I think, uh, 2021, fairly recently. And I thought that one was amazing. As well as Videodrome, I've also seen uh, Dead Zone and History of Violence. History of Violence I saw a long time ago. And I, I didn't even know that was Cronenberg until I looked it up recently. But yeah, those are the only four I've seen, plus Dead Ringers. And uh, I got to say, I wasn't expecting the more... Um, the I wouldn't say darker tone, because all of his movies are darker, but the more unsettling creepiness to this movie. And um, yeah, I was expecting more of the cool premise kind of verging on sci-fi like you get with Scanners and a bit of Videodrome. Um, those are the kind of movies I really like. Like Dead Zone also, which is a more down-to-earth, but it still has the sci-fi element of him being able to like see what people are thinking. Um, yeah, those are the kind of movies I like. That's what I was expecting, and it is not what I got. But um, yeah, still, big Cronenberg fan. I also like his son's movie, Possessor, which came out decently recently. I think I talked about it a bit last week, but yeah, Possessor was so good. Kind of more action-y, but uh, also just that cool sci-fi concept. Less body horror, but still very in the realm of horror. But um, yeah, so I told a few people to watch Dead Ringers. I know I told you, Lisa, to watch Dead Ringers. And uh, to people who may not know Cronenberg, it may be a little shock. And I hope that to other people who I told to watch it, don't think I'm too weird with my movie taste because <laughs> it is a weird one. Uh, for people who weren't expecting it. I told my mom that I was going to watch Dead Ringers for this, and she said to me, you're never going to see Jeremy Irons the same after watching it, and she also said, that's a weird choice, Josh. Why did you choose that? <laughs> and every time anybody asked me that, I was just like, oh, I love Cronenberg, yeah. You're still in shock from watching it? Yeah, it was uh, it was rather shocking, I gotta say. Um, at the beginning of the movie, shocking as in, oh, what am I watching? But at the end of the movie, I liked that kind of shock. That's the kind of shock that I liked because yeah i was expecting like a horror premise you hear the you hear the word dead ringers and you're like oh it's gonna be some horror movie in your face maybe lots of practical effects blarg for you hello welcome <laughs> what a name um but yeah that is not what you get and i think that the first half of the movie maybe like first third of the movie did let me down a bit it just made me feel very uncomfortable and i kind of didn't want to keep watching it. I didn't enjoy <laughs> watching the first half very much, but uh, it did build to something a lot better, but I don't know if that first half was necessarily needed. But um, either way, uh, a bit of background about this movie because it's kind of cool. There's some rather cool details to the production of this movie. Um, it was shot in Toronto, which was very apparent if you've ever been to Toronto or lived around Toronto. Um, I mean, yeah, Cronenberg, a bunch of movies uh, probably set in Toronto there. It was made on a budget of $13 million and it made $14 million worldwide. So just made its money back. I guess $1 million is a decent amount of profit, but I guess in the grand scheme of the uh, production company, um, quite a close number. But again, like the movie we watched last week, like, or sorry, not Pig, um, I was talking about uh, Raising Arizona two weeks ago. That would be the kind of movie that if it was released nowadays, that, that would not get the... Uh, the budget or the reception that it did but uh yeah back in this era david cronenberg just came off the fly so people uh people knew what they were getting into a bit and it made its money back but um yeah so jeremy irons as the main character main characters two main characters played in both um it was actually originally going to be maybe not originally going to be but the role was offered to robert de niro which would have been crazy but because of the subject matter he turned it down, so that would have been crazy to see De Niro in it because, I mean, I saw a Taxi Driver recently, and uh, I think De Niro, de I mean, just because of De Niro's filmography and everything he's done, he would have been a great one, but uh, Jeremy Irons, he, he killed it. He he was the highlight of the whole movie, and also William Hurt turned down the role, and I saw a quote on Wikipedia that William Hurt said, it's tough enough playing one character, and uh, yeah, so that was funny. But um, a couple other uh, backstory on this movie. It's based on the Stuart and Cyril Marcus, who were actually 
twin gynecologist from New York, just like the the characters in the movie. I wish the Winklevoss twins took the role. <laughs> the Winklevoss twins kind of would have been a, a great choice. Why didn't they get actual twins, really? Why are they uh, using Jeremy Irons for both the roles? I'll get into that a bit later on how they technically had him in both of those roles in the movie because uh, it was pretty... It was pretty great for back in 1988. They, they did it very well. But um, yeah, so I was talking about uh, Stuart and Cyril Marcus, the twin gynecologist from New York. And it's kind of a crime case. Maybe not crime, but just an interesting case that they their dead bodies were found in an apartment that was completely destroyed, food, pill bottles everywhere. And there's like feces on their couch. Their bodies were decomposing, which not too unsimilar to uh, the events that happened at the end of this movie. But um yeah, people suggested that it could be a possible suicide pact. It could be that they died of withdrawal because of all the drugs that they were taking. But um, And just like the movie as well, one of them seemed to have died first, and then the other one seemed to have died a few days later. So uh, a lot of similarities to that story. And just because that happened actually for real in New York, that's kind of just such a crazy, interesting story to begin with. It's a good one to draw inspiration from and... One last thing about those two, I read an article on The Line Up, it was a website, and it was from a patient of one of the uh, the Marcus twins, actually, and on one of the visits, she was, like, doing her gynecology stuff, <laughs> getting herself checked out, and one of them, like, started yelling at him, at her, getting angry, which was, like, mirrored in the movie as well, so it's like, these two were quite the character, and, uh, yeah, it's... A creepy thing that this movie actually happened because yeah these these twins are super super creepy in this movie uh one last thing about the background um they mention it the movie they allude to chang and ang these uh original siamese twins and uh these siamese twins they were they had like all of their limbs they had their legs they had their arms and everything but they were attached at the uh waist which is kind of like the dream sequence that one really creepy dream sequence in the movie and uh, yeah, they were real life Siamese twins. Uh, I think they're, they're pretty famous. I don't know if a bunch of people already know about them, but um, yeah, when they were, when, when they died, one of them, they were developing an illness and one of them, Cheng, as opposed to Ang, they became partly paralyzed after a stroke. And he was the one who started to kind of regress and do like, get some mental illness, do some drugs, I believe. But um, yeah, they, they say this story in the movie. They talk about it and how, the way they set it up in the movie is he says one of them, they wake up and they saw that the other one was dead. And then out of fright or out of shock that they died as well. So like they both died at the same time, which I mean, if you're actual Siamese twins, I feel like dying at the same time isn't too crazy because maybe they share the same blood, share the same, I don't know, organs, maybe. I don't know too much about them, but uh, yeah, that actually happened. And they alluded to that in the movie as well, which is just two super interesting uh, real life anecdotes about the movie so uh yeah so the film it also it won a few awards at like uh la critics new york film critics awards and it was mostly just jeremy irons being like a great actor but um no oscars or anything like that but i mean it's the oscars who really cares too much but um it was quite well received even though it was kind of twisted and kind of weird but um yeah okay so um Hey, are, we can, uh, are you streaming? Are you live right now? Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> what? Hey, guys. What's up? Uh, what are you guys talking about? Huh? We're talking about Dead Ringers. Cronenberg. Dead Ringers. Ooh, yeah. That sounds that sounds crazy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it was crazy. Hope everyone's doing well. I'm, uh, my name's Jeff. How's it going? Hope everyone's doing well. <laughs> what do you want? Um, I'm going back to the lab soon. You want to you wanna come? No, I'm good. I'm doing this. You sure? We're gonna yes. do some great gynecology. It's gonna be. It's gonna be super awesome. I'm doing this. Yeah. I'm you fine. Miss it. I'm good. No? You sure? Yes. You sure? Stop it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. You do you. Um. Okay. Yeah. I'm oh gonna go. gosh. See you guys. Yeah. See ya. Jesus Christ. That guy. He's always just nudging in on whatever I'm doing. Jeez, I was a little scuffed with the chat, but uh, it turned out okay. But <sighs> okay, where was I? Um, dead ringers. So 
yeah, um, I think my initial impressions of Dead Ringers, um, at the very beginning, like I said before, I didn't really dig it too much. Uh, the first third, very uncomfortable. It was like, whenever they were talking to each other, whenever they were just like in their apartment talking to each other, they talk so quietly, so like, so icky. Just like the, the way they talked was so creepy between themselves. And I mean, that kind of continues the whole movie. The way they act towards each other is super, super weird. But um, yeah, I just, it was so unsettling the way they talked to each other. And I mean, the opening sequence as well. The opening sequence and the opening scene were super, sets the tone to be something messed up because you have the a bunch of the gynecology mutant tools in that opening sequence that are just like, oh, they're, they're metal. And you just know that they're for like genitals. And it's like, you don't, you don't want anything down there. And um. Yeah, it was just ugh, horrible. And um, yeah, the first third of the movie, it's like these two creepy guys are gynecologists. Th they specialize in vaginas. And it's like, I, I wouldn't want those people near my genitors, genitals whatsoever. They're, just, they're so creepy. And I mean, this is a lot to just credit to Cronenberg. He's really good at setting up this creepy atmosphere and everything. And it's like, the scene where they were in that hall and they were like giving awards for that one instrument that they made. It was just like a bunch of men giving awards for this gynecology instrument. It's like, yeah, science is important and everything and it's probably revolutionary, but like, it, it's just so unsettling the way they do it. Um, but yeah, and then that first scene where they were where they were young kids. So if you haven't seen the movie, the first scene in the movie is like, they're, I don't know how how many years old, maybe like 10 to 13 years old. <laughs> and it's just the two of them walking out of their house and one of the others, they're like, hmm, do you know why that uh, people have sex? Because fish, they, they usually just lay eggs and then you, uh, you fertilize it, but uh, the real world doesn't have water to do that so you have to do it inside or they're like hmm very interesting and then they go up to this little girl and they're like do you want to have sex with us and they're like 12 and it's like oh my it was kind of funny like at the same time funny ridiculous but it was like oh my god that's the what kind of movie are we in for it, it's a very shocking first scene but um it gets a lot more darker than that because because that was a little more silly or like that's just something crazy that happens but yeah that, that was that was weird. It, it does set up some, like, it sets up their character, I guess. It's like, it shows that they're scientific. It shows that they value the scientific method. They value the beauty of life. And, and they see it very, like, objectively. They're not, like, yeah, they're just a very scientific approach, which, which is kind of a recurring theme. And also, like, the way that Cronenberg makes it, it's very, like, objective, which is cool, but... I think the most important thing there, it establishes that they're super creepy, even from a young age, which is like, yeah, they're just, they're just super creepy. Um, yeah, so we'll start talking about the characters, and I guess uh, th there's only a couple characters that I really wanted to highlight in this movie, which is Bev and Elliot, both Jeremy Irons, and um, what's the other character's name? Claire Nevo, the actress. They're kind of the main recurring characters that actually have character arcs and things to do with them. Everybody else is kind of just like background noises maybe show up in a couple scenes but um yeah so starting off Bev and Elliot played by Jeremy Irons and uh I mean every time I looked up things about this movie people are just saying yeah Jeremy Irons is amazing he kills it and he really does because it's not the type of twin movie where it's like they have like a distinct shirt that you can tell them apart they have this distinct feature about them where you can tell them apart. It's like with his performance, you, you pretty much know who is who just based on the performance, even if their their haircut is so similar. I mean, it's the exact same actor playing them, but um, yeah, because of the performance, you can tell who's doing what. At the beginning, maybe I was a bit confused, but I feel like you kind of have to get into the, the flow of the movie. You got to get in to know what's happening a bit. So maybe you're confused at first, just like everybody else in their lives. I mean, they literally switch places on purpose to fool people, but uh yeah, at some point, you get to notice the little quirks. And um, yeah, I read a little thing on this on Wikipedia about Jeremy Irons, and he used the Alexander technique, which is like a technique for acting. And it's just like he used his, his posture, his uh, trying to be in the body of each separate character in each scene. And um, I didn't look too far into it, but I mean, 
yeah, it it really worked. You can you can just you can tell even the scenes where they're together, you can their auras are just so different whenever they're together as well. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a very subtle performance which works really well for the movie it's not over the top when they're talking just together like i said before they're just so quiet they're so muted it's so creepy but like yeah you have to give him props like he he did his research he knows what he's doing and um yeah so like the the differences between the characters you can tell that elliot is the dick and beverly is like the uh the caring one the more i don't know the more reclused internal one so you have Elliot, he's, he's like the front man. He's the one who, he goes to that award ceremony and accepts the award, but he says, oh, it's all based on Beverly's research. Um, and then there's the more sinister thing that Elliot seduces the patients of his gynecology place. And when he's done with them, when he's had his fun, he passes them off to Beverly, which is, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's so icky. It's so unethical. And that's kind of just like the root of the creepiness for the whole movie. Um, yeah. And one thing that I noted was that Elliot, he always calls Beverly baby brother in like this weird, like caring way. But it's weird that he calls your identical twin baby brother, even though you're literally born at the exact same moment. I don't know if it's a thing where it's like, they're born at the same moment, but he's like, oh, I was born like, you know, a couple minutes, a couple minutes before you. So he's using that just like as any way to feel superior, but, or it's just the way he views his brother, but he always calls him baby brother, which, um, yeah, it was very demeaning. And I think it established that their relationship quite well that, uh, yeah, he feels like the superior one to Beverly. He's the front man, the one with charisma less emotional um yeah i i thought that worked really well the fact that he's kind of like th their personalities are so different but so the same at the same time um i mean they're both scientists they're both gynecologists both probably very smart but it establishes very quickly that these differences are there um but yeah um yeah the the characters are set up very well and some things that are important to note that um there's a line at the beginning where he's like oh there should be awards for the beauty of insides of people's bodies like oh award for best kidney i think he said things like that and it sets up the themes of them striving for uh perfection perfection is a is a big one and um the fact that whenever a woman comes in and she's like imperfect they deem her like a mutant and this kind of develops into one of the main like conflicts in the movie their hatred for mutant women in the movie whenever their insides are beyond fixing and uh what i got from that is it's basically an x-men movie um the mutants they're just being uh they're being improperly treated and uh that's what these guys are doing as well because um, I guess mutations is real scientific uh, things that happen. Uh, mutations are fairly common, which um, they needed to uh, realize. I mean, scientists, they, sh they should have really realized that. But yeah, it's, a, it's an X-Men movie, a really weird, twisted X-Men movie. And their superpowers are not being able to have babies instead of Wolverine claws. I think that's a weird analysis. Maybe I should move on. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so back to the, the two characters. I think the one of the important things is that they don't see themselves as individuals. And uh, yeah, this this movie plays a lot with their the fact that they're twins and using that as a way to kind of show the uh, the dichotomies in their behavior and how they complete each other and that they're pretty much one person. I think that's a very important thing and a very, very notable thing at the very end of the movie. You notice that, um, yeah, that's literally what they're trying to do. They're trying to separate themselves because they feel like they're just one person um yeah the fact that they pretend to be each other for like the entire beginning half of the movie um the lines between them are blurred people like don't know which one they're facing oftentimes and i mean whenever they seduce their patients the patients don't know whenever they've been handed off to the uh to the second brother <laughs> Which is, uh, it's so messed up it's it's just so creepy so disgusting but um 
in the end, I think it worked well. But what does this all mean to Cronenberg? What is he trying to say? And to me, it's like, it's a typical, like, Cronenberg. He, he always has body horror, right? An examination of a person, of their body. And, like, the... You don't have too much grotesque imagery. I, there's that one dream sequence. What was up with the British accent? What, the British accent in the movie? Maybe he's British. <laughs> but, um, yeah, what I, what I was saying was that um, I think a lot of the thing, the, what Cronenberg was trying to say is that uh, nobody's perfect, and these are two people who value fixing mutant people to try to make sure their reproductive organs are all all handy dandy and i mean they're very scientific about it and it's yeah that kind of what brings them down in the end the fact that they realize that they're not perfect right the fact that they deem infertile woman as imperfect is an interesting reflection on how society views the role of woman yeah it, it's uh it's true because um yeah claire all she wanted her I mean, at the beginning, she comes to the gynecologist just because she's like, oh, I want the one thing that I want in life right now is to have a child. It's going to make me feel complete because of this. And they, I guess they don't see her as differently, but like there's other scenes where, where a couple patients come in and they're like, they get angry at the patients because they don't understand what's happening inside of them, which is like, that's, ugh. It's horrible. Um, yeah, so um, some people, I think, yeah, like I was saying about the message, some people, they, they struggle with their self-image, just like these two do, and uh, they, try to be, they try to be perfect. And at the end, I think these two, they go down like a self-destructive rabbit hole and uh, because they can't accept that they are mutants as well. They're part of the X-Men. <laughs> But um, I think that's ultimately what brings them down. The fact that they realize that they think in their minds that they can't be complete if they are separated because their separation is just showing the world their mutation and their imperfectness. Um, they feel like if their two personalities were merged together, that they would feel complete. And I mean, that's pretty much how they've been living their lives. They've been doing the same job. They've been doing the same women. <laughs> and uh, they're pretty much been one person. And I think uh, Claire, as a character, her character um, highlighted their differences and really brought them apart in the end. Um, kind of just showed them what they actually are, which was super interesting. And I think those are the most interesting parts of the movie to me. Um, near the very end, um, the parts where they're talking about mutation and they can't accept that they're they're not one person. Um, yeah, I love the idea of like sinking their bodies to their drug habits <laughs> to try to be on the same page. They're, they're trying so hard to be the same person, to be one person, that when one goes down this like drug rabbit hole, the other one's like, oh, you know, the best idea right now is to do the same thing. I got to just get uh, get super drugged up and then, you know, we'll be able to, we'll be able to figure it out from there. <laughs> But, uh, uh, yeah, that doesn't go too well in the end. Not, not a great idea, Mr. Gynecologist. But, um, yeah. Uh, one last thing about these two characters is that I, I, I saw a short video on it, and they're talking about Freud. And, uh, yeah, I think it, it definitely is interesting because I learned a bit about the, the Freudian uh, studies in university. And uh, it could be like a, a personification of kind of the different parts of a person. Maybe like a personification of like the ego and the id um, and just like them going battle because I mean the whole thing is like the ego and the id have different uh, different values. They value different things and these two characters definitely value different things, right? Um, but yeah, I don't know which would be which. I didn't uh, dive too deep into my thought process on that. But uh, yeah, it, it is a visual representation of like one person's mind kind of battling against each other in the in the bodies of these two separate people who are actually one person. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a great character. It's a character study movie, and uh, he's the reason the movie works. Jeremy Irons is the reason why the movie works. Um, but, yeah, I'll move on to talking about the second character, Claire Niveau. Uh, I forget the actress's name, but uh, she was great. I thought she was a great actress. She was very unsettling still. Like, 
at the beginning of the movie, the the three main characters are still. I think she was still like really creepy. Like <laughs> she was she was unsettling. She was like a worn down actress who all she wants to do was have a baby, right? She she even like told one of them that oh she's been very promiscuous. She never used protection or anything, and that her whole purpose was to have a baby, right? And I think that it works with her character because as an actress, um, I think performers, they're very they're very internal. They have to really understand their characters, right? And I think the fact that she wants to feel connected to like a baby, another thing, is very performative. I don't want to say performative, but it, it's very much internal, which is what a lot of performers do. And uh, yeah, actors, they try to reveal the truth in all the characters they play. It's very intimate profession and uh yeah i don't know it makes sense that her character was like that which is very separate to what the two scientists because they're they're all about scientific approach and then she's all about just the feeling of being a mother was what she wanted to like a mother that was actually her own child that's what gave her purpose um so yeah there's a lot of opposites in the movie right and uh yeah she values feeling connected to other person and her drug habits is kind of what leads to their downfall in the end she and she valued like using these drugs as a way to heighten her feeling she says it's like it, it makes her feel euphoric right and uh i guess that's a feeling that the brothers never felt before i mean to an extent but it kind of extends it to a realm where they didn't know before right yeah and uh she's the reason that they go down this drug rabbit hole right um, her way of life, it's something that they had never seen before. Um, yeah, and she's also a mutant in this world, right? Um, they, they talk about how her her tunnels, there's like three separate ways. <laughs> I forget how they exactly described it, but like, yeah, she couldn't get pregnant because there's three different paths. And uh, I don't know, <laughs> there's a line where she was like, oh, can I just have triplets then? And they're like, no, that's not how it works. But um, yeah, they, they talked about it a bit in the movie, but that's the reason. Yeah, she's she's a mutant at the end of the day, which, um, uh, yeah. Um, let me think. So in the movie, she took a liking to Beverly and not Elliot. And I think that was kind of the, uh, one of the things that really brought them to uh, their downfall because um, why did she like Beverly more? Because he was the more honest one he was the more reclusive one he was the more internal one the one who was all about studying and he was more emotional than the other one and uh yeah that he was more honest that's why she liked him um and it really focused in on the two differences because they thought themselves as so similar they're just the same person but she was like no i like this one and not this one as much i'm in love with beverly not elliot and then elliot's like we're the same person what why don't you love me too? Come on. <laughs> or that's the way I'm thinking of it, right? She she brings into focus their differences, which I think was her main purpose. And uh, yeah, I mean, in the near the end of the film, she's kind of lost in the film. She goes off to film this series or whatever. And um, yeah, I think that as much as her character was important, I thought her character was very unsettling. She did a very good job, but... Um, I feel like, yeah, she was mainly there in the first third of the movie, and that was my least favorite part of the movie. But um, she was still she was still a really good actress. Her character's interactions, they're like, they're very important and everything. But um, yeah, the first third of the movie, it just, it just felt so long. I had to take a break at a point because I was like, I don't know, 40 minutes in, I took a break. I talked to some people. I'm like, I just, I didn't want to watch it. It, it wasn't the type of movie that... Uh, I enjoyed as much I, it's purposely unsettling which i understand it makes sense for the movie but like i just uh i didn't feel like continuing it at that point it did get a lot better but um yeah anything else about uh claire nevo um oh yeah i had a funny line or not a funny line for the movie but i don't know it was a funny thought it's like she got with her gynecologist really like when elliot goes to confront her while she's at work I wrote down, bring your kind of gynecologist to work day. <laughs> I don't know why I wrote that, but um, yeah, it's just gyneco... That's the root of the weirdness, the unsettlingness. You're really banging your gynecologist? Like, come on. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll go into a bit of talking about uh, the themes and just Cronenberg's direction in general, because um, yeah, 
I don't know how many of you out there have seen Cronenberg's work. It's very weird. It's very unsettling. A lot of body horror. Um, yeah, usually it's, or at least with the ones I've seen, there's a lot of like very blatant, cool sci-fi elements. It's very in-your-face gore. Um, but this, there wasn't too much of that. Um, and I was expecting more of that, to be honest. But um, some Cronenberg-isms that were in this movie was like, it was super unsettling because of the performances. The performances in Cronenberg movies, I feel like, are kind of what make, he, he casts very, very well. It's what makes the movies, um, I mean, there's long lingering shots on people. They like think very often. I love just movies that use reaction shots, less dialogue to say what they're thinking. Um, and yeah, that's a lot of props to Jeremy Irons. And um, one thing that they did really well was that when they were trying to show that uh, Claire could tell them apart, there's a scene where one of them comes in, she kisses him, and then she moves towards the camera, and she, like, puts her hand on her lip, and she's like, hmm, that's not right. That's that's not the one that I'm used to uh, used to being with. Um, but yeah, it's the performance like that and the thought of Cronenberg to show that on camera and reveal those nuances. Of, I mean, yeah, that's, that, that's what makes the movie work so well. Um, yeah, another uh, Cronenberg-ism... Uh, the color, bl the blood red, just like blood, I guess, is a very Cronenberg thing. He uses a lot of blood in his stuff, but um, the blood red of the operating gowns that they use are so creepy. It's like, it's so cult-like. They're in an operating table and they're, they're dressed up in these like super just like plain red outfits. And uh, m my thought about that was like the red is kind of like representing of people's insides, right? Blood red insides we are, the color red is just associated with that and it's like these two characters are so obsessed with the beauty of the inside of people's bodies and everything and in this room where they like perform these procedures they're wearing like completely red kind of representing that uh that's where they do all the work representing the inside of people's bodies which is it's interesting i i didn't uh, delve too much deep into that into my thought process but uh i mean yeah it's just uh a smart symbol there and um yeah it works very well um let's see i think that the most uncomfortable scene in my opinion was that operating table scene um where he's kind of later on in the movie and he's operating on that one random woman with the new tools and he he brings out these disgusting metal tools and he's just like to everybody okay so when i say hand me this hand me this and don't ask any questions and then like ah. Uh, it's just the fact that the woman's legs, they're, they're propped up. She's just, that, that position is just so unsettling. And we know from the backstory of the movie what this guy is like. The guy's kind of messed up right now. And it's like, oh, d don't just, you really don't want him to go to work and use those tools on her. It's so unsettling. And I mean, yeah, it turns out super horrible. She almost dies because of it because he's using those messed up tools and then, like, he jumps on top of her to try to get, like, that, uh, whatever drugs in that mask that she's inhaling. It's like, oh, I, I hated that scene. But, like, I hated it in a good way. That was, the, that, was, that was a good kind of unsettling because it's very revealing for the character and it works very well with the plot. But, like, it was super, like, oh, that was the one that made me squirm the most, in my opinion. But, um, yeah, it's just being in that position, being so vulnerable like that, it's, it's very uncomfortable and, like... I'm not a woman, but, like, I feel like this movie would be a lot more uncomfortable for women in general because, like, yeah, these two dudes are literally... They're they're preying on these women, right? It was unsettling, but you couldn't look away. I agree. I agree with that because, yeah, you're just hoping that he doesn't, uh, he doesn't use those tools. Yeah, exactly. You saw it, Lisa, terrifying as a woman. I agree. I think that's... Yeah, I can't relate to uh, that as much as a man, but, like, yeah, having these men being the top of these professions on uh, the women anatomy, that's just, it must be so unsettling for women specifically. And I feel like that scene would be, I was so unsettled by it, but yeah, like you're saying, Lisa, I feel like it's just terrifying as a woman. It was, yeah, that was that was a good, good as in very much makes you think, makes you, uh, it works with the movie. This movie shows so many fears that a woman has all in one plot. Yeah, that's very true. And um I think that the fact that Cronenberg, the way he does it, it's very objective, very scientific, right? 
He's not like trying to get you to sympathize with the main characters, which is a good thing because they're super creepy, they're super messed up, and you know that going into it, right? And uh, he does that very well because if you had a, a a character study movie where you're trying to sympathize with these main characters, it's like, like to an extent you do, but you also realize that they're super crazy, they're super messed up, and you put yourself in the position of the patient in that scene, and you're just yeah, it's it's horrible. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, that was that was that was a scene that was very much highlighted in my mind. It was very well made, very good filmmaking, but super, super unsettling. Um, so I'll move into some of the main themes of the movie here. I think that um, some of them, which make me like the movie more, the themes of twins, which is kind of the, it verged on a little bit of a sci-fi. I, I just like, I kind of have this genre where it, it doesn't necessarily have to be sci-fi, but it's like cool concept. And that's what I look, that's what I look for. And uh the, the theme of the twins was the coolest concept, right? Uh, when they're trying to sync their bodies, they're actually one person. And yeah, just the idea of twins, it's like somebody who's exactly like you. And uh, does that make you feel less unique, right? I wouldn't know. I guess I would know. I mean, I have uh, my twin, my twin Jeff. But um, <laughs> yeah, does it, does it make them feel less unique? I feel like in this film, um, because they see themselves as one person, when they begin to see that they have differences between them, the uniqueness isn't something that they like because they just want to be the same person. But uh, it makes you think still like, yeah, in the movie, they share the same life. They share the same experiences, right? They share the same women and they are what completes each other. And I feel like it would be a weird feeling. Imagine you had a twin and uh, that twin dies and then it's just you. I think you're so just you're so connected to that other person. That would be such a such a strange feeling, right? Um, and yeah, in this movie, they very much literally complete each other. And um, I think that the movie has a very distinct turning point when Bev says that he'd like to keep the experience to himself. Um, he's coming home. I think it was with Claire, and. Uh, Elliot's like, oh, tell me all about it. Tell me all the details. And he's like, no, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to keep these experiences to myself, which is something they never did, right? They never, uh, they never didn't share what was going on. They always, they always told each other what was happening. They pretty much felt the same things because they tried to experience the same things the entire time, right? And um, yeah, because they live their whole lives and they don't think of themselves as individuals they just think of themselves as one person and um yeah I, I think going back to like the talk about freud and everything it's like a representation of either this part parts of the brain or even like mental illness where it's like these two parts of the brain they're literally fighting against each other because i guess you can kind of think of them as just two parts of a brain and yeah they're fighting each other at the end and they have this conflict that arises. So uh, yeah, that was really cool. I, I, that's the kind of part I like where it's a physical representation of an idea. That's that's more the realm of cool concept that I'm trying to talk about here. But um, yeah, uh, moving on, if we talk about the themes of um, mutation kind of and like reproduction and everything. Um, yeah, at first we see them that they, they think of reproduction as a science. They think of everything as a science, right? And like I said before, the filmmaking is very objective. You, you can tell that they're creeps. And uh, you're not trying to sympathize with them too much. And yeah, even the scenes at the very end, like it's not glorified. It doesn't highlight when one of them died and like the brutal way that he did die. Like it's less gory than most Cronenberg movies. But um, yeah, and uh, on the themes of like reproduction, Claire, she wants to she wants to have a baby so bad. She wants to feel connected to them. But um, we don't get a sense that these two want to have kids. Imagine if they had kids. That, ugh. like, would they feel like they share ownership on these kids? I just, I couldn't see them as parents. That would be so weird. And like, yeah, they're just so detached from uh, Claire's point of view because like, yeah, they see it as a science and she sees it as a experience and uh, as her nature. Um, their profession, it's like they're fixing people so that they can reproduce. It's like they're doing their duty to the world to allow life to go on. They're like, oh. This is the natural way of life. This is how uh, we just need to make sure we preserve the scientific nature of the world is kind of how I saw it. And in the end, it's like they're so egotistical 
that when there's a mutant woman, they see it as irregular, which is which is a little weird because they're scientists. And I feel like after all these years of being in the gynecology profession, they should realize that, that there's a lot of unnormal things going on with people. Like mutations aren't too crazy unnatural. And if their profession is literally to fix people so that they can reproduce, how have they not like noticed these mutations before or been weirded out by them? Maybe it was like Claire, maybe Claire kind of just like, striked that thought into their heads that it was so wrong and everything but um yeah that's a weird thought it's like that's what they deal with right they deal with people who are not normal and try to make them normal which is yeah it's weird because they're obsessed with inner beauty they're obsessed with perfection they see mutants as not normals and uh yeah claire shows them that they as well are mutants and they're not normal um yeah, let's see here. What else do I have to say? Yeah, so I think last thing on this topic is like, they are mutants that can't be fixed. And I guess talking a little bit about the end of the movie, it's like they can't understand that they can't be fixed. And they try so hard to do that at the end. They tried so hard to do that at the end, fix themselves, but uh, they can't. They can never be one because they are mutant. It's an X-Men movie, I'm telling you. Um, let's see here. Um, oh, yeah, I just wanted to talk a bit about the uh, the drug use in the movie. Um, so I was thinking, it's like, why does Beverly turn to drugs? Like, I think, to me, he turns to drugs because that Claire shows him this new experience that he's never felt. He's never felt the, the euphoria or just the feeling that she's trying to describe, that she... Uh, that, that he's like, oh, this is a new world that I've never experienced before, and he's uh, trying to do that. But, um, yeah, it, it was it was weird, because he's like a man of science. And uh, it's, yeah, I guess it's kind of changing his worldview. He's, he's going from a man of scientific to kind of some values that are a little more similar to Claire's. Um, but, yeah, so he starts taking the drugs, and then he takes the drugs way more when he thinks that she leaves her, which is like... <laughs> he just called one person and then a man's voice came up. He's like, oh, she's cheating on me. She's cheating on me. It's over. My life is ruined. <laughs> you hear one man on the phone. Um, if I still want to see the movie, should I dip to avoid spoilers? Um, I think that, yeah, I, I'm going to talk about the ending in a second, which I think maybe you could avoid, but um, I'll I'll tell you that this movie is very very weird. I don't know if I told you about this movie before, but it's not as Cronenbergian as the other ones. It's a character study. It's super creepy. It's very sexual. It's very messed up, but um, Jeremy Irons is so good, and uh, once you get through the first half of the movie, it feels... It, it gets better, in my opinion, but um, yeah, and channel points when. Um, I think there's like a certain number of hours you have to do live streams, and then it like lets you add that to your channel, so you know, Maybe sometime soon. That would be fun. Hopefully I can do that uh, within the month. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Watch it Watch it with your parents, definitely. Watch it with your twin. <laughs> that would be a little unsettling. But um, yeah, definitely not a family watch. Definitely not a living room TV situation. This is a laptop in your room by yourself. And uh, just try to <laughs> get into the movie. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a weird movie. I, I would recommend it. Um, I'm curious, have you seen any other Cronenberg movies? Have you seen Videodrome or Scanners, Dead Zone, The Fly, I guess, the most popular? Um, if you've seen some of those other ones, I'd say you might be a little more uh, palatable <laughs> in that way. But um, yeah, so um, what was I talking about? Um, I was talking about the drug use, right. Um, I think that the, f the final scene shows that these men of science, right, um, they finally turn to these drugs and then he's trying to sink himself to uh, experience this. You know what? I think I think you actually should dip because I don't want to spoil too much. Maybe watch maybe watch it back later because yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start talking about the end scene a bit more right now. Um, yeah, he, he can't understand the less scientific feelings of being on these drugs and they're trying to rationalize it. I think it's like they're disillusioned into thinking that they can fix each other, right? Alrighty. See you around, soldier. But, um, yeah, so talking about the ending, I guess, yeah, I'll talk about the ending right now. 
So I really liked the ending. I thought the ending was great. I thought it was super unsettling, super creepy, but it was great. And again, it kind of mirrors that uh, real life case that happened where uh, these two uh, twins were, twin gynecologists were found dead in an apartment, right? Um, yeah, so they're on these drugs. They're going crazy, eating cake. I really love the line where he's like, but I want ice cream. <laughs> it was so silly, but like, uh, it worked. It, it was just a notable line in my opinion, but um, yeah, so these two guys, two twins, all drugged up and uh, I think yeah they're they're seeing this new side of life less scientific and then they're trying to use their sciencey brains to think hmm I can rationalize this I can fix this and they're trying to just make up these excuses if I sink myself to my brother then we'll be able to figure it out if um if I do this procedure oh I figured it out I can do this procedure and we'll fix ourselves we'll make we'll make ourselves one again and uh yeah oh it was it was great it was I think it was well done. It's one of those things where it's like, you don't show it exactly like Cronenberg usually does. You don't show the super grotesque gory parts. And then when, when his body's like lingering in the background all opened up, oh, it was, that, that was perfect because I didn't want to see it up close. I didn't want to see it up close. And I think it worked so well, just like, it's a little sobering for the audience, not the character. When he's walking around, you see the wide shot of the room. You're like, it's super disgusting. There's food, drug pills everywhere. And then you see this just body ripped open in the background. It's like, whew, it worked so well. And also, I really loved when he walked outside, he went to the telephone and he called Claire and she says, this is a great ending line. She said, hello, who is this? And then he hung up and he went inside and he died alongside his brother. Like, that is such a good ending line, in my opinion. Hello, who is this? Because he lost half of himself. He doesn't know who he is anymore. And uh, yeah, oh, that the ending was probably my favorite part. I really, really liked the ending. Um, I'm curious what you thought of the ending, Lisa. Oh, when he kept whispering Ellie over and over again. Yeah, yeah, that was another great part. Oh, that's another just... That's another sobering moment for the audience. It's like the character is realizing, or I mean, he's still like drugged out of his mind, but you realize like, okay, there's no going back from this. And I think, you know, because of Jeremy Irons performance that he knows that Ellie ain't coming back. He's dead. But um, the character himself is trying to rationalize like, oh no, this isn't happening. It's like, yeah, when something super horrifying happens and you're trying to tell yourself, oh, this is a dream, right? This isn't happening. And just... Yeah, he's stuck in that state of, like, whispering Ellie over and over, trying to wish it didn't happen. But, uh, yeah, that was... I love when it, I love how long it lingered on that. And, yeah, he said it so many times. That was great as well. Yeah, but, um, yeah, I really liked the ending. I dug the ending because it kind of fell into that uh, more cool premise. It really gets you thinking about, uh, yeah, their relationship. It was a horrifying ending image of Bev laying on Ellie. It was. Um and yeah, it's kind of like at the end, they're right beside each other. It's kind of like in the dream sequence, they're like right beside each other, conjoined at the uh, at the waist. And in the end, uh, they're conjoined back together. They uh, got birthed as one, and uh, now they die as one, which is, uh, yeah. And um, one thing that I noticed, it was like foreshadowed at the beginning of the movie. I guess not foreshadowed, but like once the ending scene started to begin. Um, so, so there was a scene... At, near the beginning where he's talking to a patient and he's like, no, nah, it's, it's your husband. Actually, you're not the problem. It's your husband. That's likely the problem. And he's like, Oh, why can't you see him? And he's like, Oh no, we don't work on men. We only work on women. That's our specialty, right? We're gynecologists. And, um, yeah, at the end when he started, he was like, they were going to do like an operation on each other. It's like, well, their profession is women. They've never done this on a man before. So it probably won't go very well. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's not their specialty. And I thought that was, I thought that was just like a nut. It's one, it's one of those things where you think it's like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. That That's why the scene was in there to begin with. That scene of the woman uh, talking about her husband. And um, I mean, yeah, it was very clearly foreshadowed when they were talking about the Siamese twins. I guess that was a lot near the end of the movie. But um, yeah, talking about the Siamese twins. And that was a really heartbreaking shot as well. When, when they're talking about the Siamese twins, they say the last line and he's like, he died from the fright of seeing his brother. And then they both realize, like, oh, God, if one of us dies, we're both going down. Also terrifying that they were referring to each other as Aang and Chang. Okay, yeah, this is what I was just talking about. But uh, you only knew which one was which uh, when Ellie called him baby brother. And then you re realize what was going to happen next. Yeah, I completely agree. And, uh, yeah, uh, 
this ending, it, it worked so well for me because of the references, because of the concept, and because of the way that they set it up. But, um, yeah. And the way he says baby brother all the time is so messed up. <laughs> it's so messed up. But, um, yeah. Uh, I love the ending. And, um, yeah, I guess uh, that's a lot of the movie that I wanted to talk about. Um, oh, also, the dream sequence. I guess that was very, like, uh, I know I told you, Lisa, when uh, I was watching it, wait until you get to this point in the movie, the dream sequence was very, very, uh, that was more typical Cronenberg, but to that point in the movie, it was very, very normal world, right? You haven't seen anything really supernatural yet, and you get that dream sequence, and you see this weird fleshy thing attaching their waist. It's like, oh. They're literally the Siamese twins dreaming that they're the Siamese twins. And, uh, yeah. And I think that it's a visual representation of Claire being that instigator to them being separated and then losing each other, right? Because in the dream sequence, she, like, comes down and bites that weird fleshy thing and, like, tears them apart, which is super disgusting. But, um... Yeah, it was a visual representation that uh, she was the uh, she was the instigator. She's what kind of tore them apart, but not to her own fault, just because they're crazy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I thought I liked that dream sequence. And I, I read up that there was a, another dream sequence that they were going to add into the movie, but the, they deleted it. And it was like a dream sequence where there was a, a twin that came out of Bev's stomach, like another thing came out of Beverly's stomach. And, oh, I'm sure that would have been super disgusting. And just like the first dream sequence. But, um, yeah. Uh, Dead Ringers. I don't know if I have uh, much else to say. But um, I think in the end that I liked it. It was very unsettling. Very different. Um, not as Cronenberg I was as I was expecting. But I think going forward I should expect this more from Cronenberg. Because I haven't seen a, a terribly large number of his filmography. But, um yeah, in the end, I liked it. And I like talking about it here because I think some of the ideas and the way they were set up was done very, very well, right? And uh, in the end, I loved the ending. But yeah, it was that first half, the first third, that I was like, this feels so long. It just felt like it was dragging because of how unsettling it was, because of how slow-paced all the scenes were. It was mainly people talking to each other and them just being their creepy selves, establishing that they share the same women, that they're obsessed with inner beauty and everything. And it was just... It was so creepy. It was so unsettling. And uh, that wasn't the kind of movie that I wanted. And it didn't end up turning to be uh, too much like the beginning. But when it was so unsettling like that, yeah, I took a break. And I was like, I don't really want to watch <laughs> this movie too much. But um, it got better. And again, the performances are amazing. Jeremy Irons, this is the Jeremy Irons show. He kills it. And uh, like my mom said, I will never look at Jeremy Irons the same after this. <laughs> Yeah, um, it was a character study. It was a great character study of... And I say character study as in one person because it's literally just studying this one character. And to me, it's like the personification of his mind kind of separated into two physical things, one character and two bodies, which is quite literally what it was. But um, yeah, it was an interesting premise. And uh, it was worth the payoff in the end, in my opinion. I hope you felt the same way, Lisa. I hope you uh, got something out of it. And I hope you liked uh, thinking about it after the movie was done and um i'd say it's not for most people people who don't know cronenberg i definitely give a caution to watching the movie um because yeah because the subject matter because it's so weird and uh in the end uh, i gave it a three and a half stars on letterbox so like a seven out of ten but uh, i mean it's just a ranking I, I like talking about it more than just giving it a uh, definitive ranking but um overall I enjoyed it, and I'm happy I watched it. I'm glad we chose it. I was freaked out overall, but glad I went through that viewing experience. Yeah, and I know I was talking to you when we were watching it um, that uh, you had never seen anything this disturbing, anything this unsettling, but um, I'm glad that you ended up liking it. But um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about Dead Ringers. I feel like uh, it's coming to a close here. Um, yeah, and again, I don't think that this kind of movie would make money right now if this movie came out right now nobody's run into the theaters to see this <laughs> maybe just based on cronenberg's name alone and his prestige but like uh yeah nobody's running out to see movies like this just like i said in the first week of raising arizona the landscape of movies has changed so much which is a little unfortunate and hopefully theaters can hang on 
for a little while and we can see more original stuff but um yes that is dead ringers i uh, i hope you enjoyed me talking about this um even if you haven't seen the movie i hope you enjoyed it because there's some very well made it's a very well made film there's some very thoughtful themes in it and uh yeah i hope you enjoyed so uh next week for the film spot cine club i will not be around monday i'm going to be on a film set unfortunately i mean fortunately for me i'm looking forward to it but um I will not be able to be here on Monday at 7 p.m. So I'm going to move it to Wednesday at 7 p.m. Hopefully most of you can still uh, make that. But um, I had a few ideas for movies. And uh, I was planning on watching a movie with a couple friends called Broadcast News. I hope they don't mind that uh, I might verge to choosing this. But um, yeah, the movie Broadcast News. I didn't know too much about it. I think it's on Disney+. Plus. It has Holly Hunter, which I love Holly Hunter. She was in Raising Arizona. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm thinking of doing for next week. Broadcast news. Let me just pull it up here on IMDb real quick. Okay, so... Broadcast news. I didn't know too much about this movie, and it's one of those movies where I see and I'm like, oh, this and this premise sounds very interesting. Um, I like the actors, and uh, to me, when I hear the title and I see some of the images that are related to it, I feel very, like, very office space, something like that, like a office space with maybe a more rom-com feel but um here let me pull it up here fix in the screen okay broadcast news so uh it has uh william hurt albert brooks and holly hunter uh two take two rival television reporters one handsome and talented both male and add one producer female mix well and watch the sparks fly but uh it seems like a very, a little different tone to the movie this week. So, uh, yeah, I didn't want to do another uh, super creepy, unsettling movie next week. But, um, yeah, I'm planning on watching this with a couple of friends. I hope they don't mind that. Uh, I think I'm going to choose this for next week. Like I said, it's on Disney+. Plus, um, and I hope you can find a way to watch it no matter no matter how it, uh, no matter how you do it. Whatever, as long as you watch it. Uh, who's this director? James L. Brooks. I uh, can't say that the name rings out to me. He has directed broadcast news as good as it gets. I've heard that's very good. Terms of endearment. All right. But um, yeah, this will be uh, ooh, nominated for seven Oscars. Okay. Maybe I should have heard about this before. I feel like I've heard the name before, but I just didn't pay, uh, pay much interest to it. But um, this will be next week. Broadcast news. And remember, Wednesday, 7 p.m. Wednesday, 7 p.m. Not uh, Monday, 7 p.m., unfortunately. But um. Yes, that is it for the main portion of the Cine Club.